Welcome to our Wednesday evening study. Tonight we are continuing in the book of Jeremiah. We're going to be looking at Jeremiah chapter 18, the first six verses. We started uh, this last week in our study of the potter's house. I trust that you've had a good week thus far. I trust that God has been blessing you. I trust that you have tried your best or are trying your best to be the encourager that God wants you to be for others each and every day. Well, as we continue our study in Jeremiah, you may remember that the Lord called Jeremiah to be a prophet to the people of Judah. Jeremiah's ministry spanned some 40 years. It's a tough ministry. God had told Jeremiah it was going to be tough when he first started. And during this time, God used many ways to get his message across to his people through Jeremiah. God is trying to tell the people, judgment is on the way. You need to change your ways. He's calling them to repentance, but yet that did not happen. Sometimes in Jeremiah's life, as in pastors' lives today, sometimes God just told Jeremiah, preach. Other times he said, Jeremiah, I want you to use an illustration. I want you to act out the sermon. He's doing that here in this passage tonight in Jeremiah chapter 18. He's acting out this message, if you will, or the illustration of going down to the potter's house. Use your imagination with me once again tonight. As you go into this potter's house, it's a small house. Out back there is a field of mud where the clay is taken. Inside the potter's house, you see walls that are, are lined with shelves. On those shelves are vessels of all shapes and sizes and colors and designs. And in that room, you'll see a vat of water, and you'll see clay in the water. In one corner of that place, in the potter's house, you'll see a furnace. That's where the vessel that was designed and made by the potter is fired to burn the design in and create the brilliant, brilliant color of the vessel. In another corner, there's a pile of broken pieces of clay. In the Bible, that's called pot shirts, just a junk pile. But the center figure of the potter's house is a wheel on the top and a wheel on the bottom. And you also have a spindle. You have the potter that's seated on the bottom, or pot, the potter is seated right in front of the wheel. The clay is placed on the upper wheel. With a lower wheel, the potter takes his foot and begins to move those wheels. His eyes are ever looking at that clay, molding it with his skillful hands. Well, who represents who in this illustration? Or you go to Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8. The Bible says, But now, O Lord, thou art our Father. We are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. So right here it's telling us that God is the potter, and we are the clay. The wheel on which the vessel is made represents the revolving circumstances in our lives. In James chapter 3, it's called the course of nature or the wheel of life. So here in this illustration here, in Jeremiah chapter 18, you have God the potter, you have us the clay, and then you have the revolving circumstances of life. Now last week we looked at how the clay is made. We find this message in the potter's house in Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 3. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. We see here how this clay is made. He, the potter, wrought a work on the wheels. That's God. And this tells us about life. It tells us really how we are made. Though it doesn't specifically say it, in this passage here, it's all involved in the picture. The eyes represent the omniscience of God in that God knows everything. The hands speak of the omnipotence of God. 
God is all powerful. God can do anything he wants to with the clay. God can do anything he wants to with us. So many times we find ourselves arguing with God. Why this? Why this? Why did that happen? Why did this other thing happen? And if you continue to argue with God, it'll just drive you crazy because you will not get an answer most of the time. The foot. Keeping the wheel moving. This represents the omnipresence of God. Have you thought about that much that God is everywhere? God is in everything. And whatever the revolving circumstance of your life may be, the omnipresence of God is involved. God knows your situation, whether it be good, bad, or, or mediocre. God knows what's going on in your life. Then we started looking at how we are marred. In Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 4, this parable takes a, a kind of a tragic turn. The vessel that is made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. And there's a story of the human race. It's the story of you, it's the story of me, marred in the hands of the potter. There's a defect here, and that defect is sin. It was pa passed down to us from Adam and Eve. The Bible tells us that, that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's, not, there's none righteous, no, not one. So that there's a danger here in that this piece of clay that is now marred in the hands of the potter, if it continues on, and there cannot be some way to rectify that situation, then there's a junk pile that is building. That clay is useless. If the clay doesn't ultimately yield itself to the hand of the potter, the potter then has no choice but to take that piece of clay and throw it over into the junk pile. In the New Testament, we find Jesus talked about a junk pile. In the city of Jerusalem, they had a garbage dump called Gehenna. Jesus used that garbage dump as an illustration that there is, even today, a junk pile in the universe where people go who refuse to allow the master potter to mold them into the vessel of his design. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 9, the Bible says, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Here's a picture of a human being, people like you and I, arguing with God, in conflict with God. And look at the comparison here. Let the pot shirt, the broken piece of clay, strive with the pot shirts of the earth. In other words, in that junk pile, you have those broken pieces of pottery. And it's like they begin talking to one another. And one of them says to the other one, Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What maketh thou? Or thy work, he hath no hands? In essence, there's a piece of broken pottery. And he's making fun of, or he's throwing off on the potter. You say, well, okay, that's well and good, but that doesn't happen today. I beg to differ with you that it happens all of the time. People today are constantly throwing off on God, making fun of God, trying to tell God how to run His universe. They're like that broken piece of pottery. They rebel against God. They refuse to have God preeminent in their life. They refuse, people today refuse to have God in their school system. They refuse to have God in their psychology. They refuse to have God in their world system. There's no room for God. Just like a bunch of pieces of broken pottery. You know, we can even go one step farther. Look at believers as well tonight. How many believers are there tonight who used to be in God's house? who used to be serving God with a fire in their life, who used to be at God's house all the time, but yet now 
something else has taken its place. It may be striving to get ahead. It may be other areas that have just taken in, and we just don't have time for God anymore. You say, well, I still love God, but what are we doing for God? But then we see here how we are mended. Once again, here's a story of life. First of all, we have how we are made. Then we see how we are marred. Now, it really begins to get good because we learn now down at the potter's house how we are mended. Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 4 once again, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make it. That's the good news. That's the great news of the gospel. He made it again. That's how we are mended. He makes us all over again. Listen, aren't you glad tonight that God is a God of a second chance? First of all, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you've never asked Jesus to come into your life and forgive you of your sins. For the majority of people, especially in America, aren't you glad God is a God of the second chance? For some, He's given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to invite Jesus Christ into their life. But for believers tonight, aren't you glad that God is the God of the second chance, third chance, fourth chance, on and on we could go? You look at Jonah. God said, Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. <laughs> he went the opposite direction. Eventually, God came to Jonah the second time. He gave him another chance. In the New Testament, you find that, that Mark failed the Lord, but Paul said later on, he said, bring Mark because he is profitable unto me. Simon Peter. I mean, here's a guy that says, yes, Lord, I love you. I'll do anything for you. And yet we find that Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet after Jesus rose from the dead, one time the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ said, Go and tell my disciples and Peter. A God of a second chance. All of us are marred. All of us in one sense of the word are spiritual wrecks. But God says, If you will let me, I will take that broken vessel of your life and I will make it new again. Listen, there's salvation in that statement tonight. Verse 4 says he made it again. That's what happens when we are born again. When we invite Jesus Christ to come into their life, we need to be born the second time because the first time we were born wrong or we're born with sin. We were born a flawed vessel. But because of the miracle of the new birth in Jesus Christ, being born again, God can make us over again. There's salvation in this picture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. God makes new creations out of us. There's sanctification in that verse. In other words, God has a design. And as he is shaping us, the vessel, he's removing all that excess clay getting rid of everything around us that's not pertinent to the design, the purpose, the intention of that vessel. And just like the potter, when he gets that vessel like he wants it, note what happens. It's like he takes a long shovel, goes over to the furnace, and puts that vessel in the fire. Now, why does he do this? It's not to ruin the vessel but to refine the vessel, to burn into that vessel its design, to add to, add to it and bring brilliance to the color. The fire is intended to make the vessel what the potter intends for it to be. And that's how God sanctifies us as well. Sometimes God puts us in the furnace of pain and it hurts. 
Sometimes God puts us in the, fur, in the furnace of persecution. And it's uncomfortable. But God uses all of these fiery trials that come to our life to help us to become what He wants us to be. Many years ago when I was working at Ford Motor Company, the department I worked in was called the Ring Gear Department. We would get these rings in that would go into automobiles. And my job and the machines that I was in charge of, we had to make teeth, if you will, into the ring gears. We had a rougher that would, you, that would load into that machine, and you had these 32 razor-like blades that would cut into that ring gear. Then it would transfer it over to a finisher, had the same blades but fewer to make it smooth. After that was all said and done, these ring gears were put into a huge basket. That basket was taken to the next apartment over, which was called Heat Treat. These huge furnaces, those ring gears would be put on hooks, and they would go through that heat treat. And I did not know really what it was for when I first started working there. But I come to find out that those ring gears go through that heat treat to harden them up, to get rid of all the impurities there so that when they come out of heat treat, they will be able to ultimately be installed and vehicles to help the vehicles run properly. But you know, in like manner, that's exactly what God is doing in our life. When we go through the fires, and we're going to go through the fires if we're not going through some right now, God is refining us to sanctify us and to make us what we ought to be. Make us stronger. These experiences of life that we go through burn out the darkness of sin and burn in the gold to the glory of God. It comes through our hearts, comes through our lives. Once again, there's sanctification in this statement. He made it again. There's glorification in this statement. The time comes when he takes that vessel and puts it on the walls. There the vessel is now, on the wall, on those shelves that we talked about. It's so beautiful. And it's exactly the way the potter designed it to be. It's exactly the way the potter intended for it to be. People come and, and they look at those beautiful vessels and they say, Wow! Look at that vessel. What a potter. The person that made it. You see, the beauty of the vessel calls attention to the glory of the potter. We find in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet or equipped for the master's use and prepared for every good work. God has different purposes for every individual. It was said about Paul, he was a chosen vessel unto me. Every one of us is a chosen vessel unto the Lord. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what job we may, we may have. We are a chosen vessel unto the Lord Jesus Christ, our great potter. There's an old invitation song I grew up on. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Just as the potter wants to have his way with the clay, sometimes he gets into that clay, and sometimes that, that clay may be a little tough, may be a little bit hard to work with, and he has trouble with it. But have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. In other words, Lord, you are the great potter. Lord, I give you permission to mold my life and make it to what you want it to be. 
for your desires and not mine. After thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. All God wants out of us is to be yielded to him. So that he, the great potter, can take our life and mold us and make us and use us for his honor and for his glory. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for who you are. And Lord, thank you for the example that we have tonight in the potter's house. And Lord, I pray that if there is anyone watching, listening tonight that does not know you as their personal Savior, I pray that they would take this opportunity to invite you to come into their life and ask you to forgive them of their sins, knowing that there's no prerequisites, that you're waiting and willing to forgive. For Christians tonight, believers, Lord, some may be struggling with different things in their lives. Some may be struggling because they want to do something and they feel like you want them to do something else. Lord, just help us to be yielded and obedient to what you want done in our lives. We love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much once again for being with us tonight. I trust that you will if you can, be with us in our services Sunday, 9 o'clock Sunday morning and 1030 as well. If you do not feel comfortable uh, coming back in a corporate uh, worship service yet, that is fine. Uh, we have our 1030 service that is online, Facebook and YouTube as well. So please join us there if you cannot be here in person. God bless you. May you have a tremendous week. And remember, it doesn't hurt to smile, even with mask on. It doesn't hurt to smile and encourage someone on a daily basis. We love you. Have a great rest of the week.